Today, we're going to be creating a really cool particulate rain that can actually make your materials wet. So, let's hop into it. Hello everybody and welcome back to another episode of CGC Weekly here on the CG Cookie Blender Training YouTube channel. This week, we're gonna be looking at a way that we can create realistic particulate rain in Blender that actually interacts with our materials to make things look wet. So, I don't wanna, you know, blabber on at all, so let's go ahead and dive right in. So I will be working with a preset Blender file here for an example. So if you guys would like to follow along using this exact same Blender file, there will be a download link down in the description so you can follow along here. But if you want to apply it to your own scene, that's perfectly fine as well. Basically, all this scene is is just a ground plane with a material on it, a camera, and an empty that the camera is tracked to. So it's nothing too fancy, and then the camera just, you know, moves along like this. All right, so basically what we're going to be doing here in order to create particulate rain that can interact with the materials of the surface is we're going to add another plane that we're going to use to emit particles. We're going to assign those to be basically rain particles. Then we're going to work on uh, making it interact with the materials down here using dynamic paint and wet maps. So let's go ahead and get started. The first thing I'm going to do is add that extra emitter plane that we're going to be using to emit um, those particles and by default it adds in the same position as that ground plane So we'll move it up and out that way. We don't get that, anno that annoying Z fighting um, And all we need to do is position this somewhere where it's out of view from the camera So basically that's anywhere, you know from here up for me uh, But in some scenes if you're working like an alleyway You might have to have the camera angled a little bit lower or have this rain plane emitter a little bit higher Anyway, uh, once we have this plane in a position that we can work with, all we need to do is come into the particle settings and add a new particle set or system. So I'm gonna go ahead and just name this rain particles. And by default, it's pretty much exactly what we're looking for. Particles are emitted and they fall through and that's exactly what we want. So since we don't really have to do anything with this, I'm just gonna go ahead and click bake because that's really all we need to do. This looks like rain as is. Now, if for some reason you do want more or less particles, you will have to tweak that, but we don't really have to change any other particle settings. Anyway, once this is done, um, all we have to do is kind of give it the look of rain. And the way to do that is to use tiny spheres that we can use to represent the particles. So I'm actually going to come into my second render layer down here, and I'm going to press Shift A and add an icosphere. And by default, this icosphere is actually pretty high poly. So in order to drop the poly count, I'm going to open up my tool panel by pressing T. And I'm going to come to this menu down here where it says add icosphere. I'm going to drop the subdivisions down to one. Now, if for some reason you don't see this menu, it's probably just because you have to click this plus down here and it should pop up. Anyway, once we have this added, we can actually just shade it smooth by changing the shading to smooth over here in the left panel. And then we can add a new material to it. I'm just going to call this material rain or you could call it droplet or whatever you'd like um, from the surface we're just going to choose the principled shader and we're going to change the transmission value of the principled shader up to one that way it transmits light uh, and also we're going to change the roughness value to somewhere around 0.0 not 0 .0, 0 0.05 just so it has a little bit of roughness but not too much perfect so now if i switch into rendered view here you can see that our rain particle kind of looks like rain which is pretty much what we're looking for in the end, this is going to be blurred like crazy, so it really doesn't matter how accurate it is, as long as it transmits light in a somewhat realistic fashion. If we really want to go for a realistic water, we should also change the IOR here to 1.330, um, but this really shouldn't change too much. Anyway, once we have our rain particle added, we can give it a name. I'm going to come into the object settings here and just name this rain droplet, and I'll come back into my first render layer, select our particle emitting plane, come into the particle settings tab, scroll down and under the render tab i'm going to choose object from the list of different uh, possible render types and then for the dupli object or duplicated object we'll select our rain droplet and just like that we have a bunch of big honking rain droplets falling so these are a little bit too big so i'm going to drag the scale down a little bit here to something that's a little bit more reasonable uh, it's going to be really hard to get a, a good size for these if for some reason, you can't lower the slider less than 0.1 by clicking and dragging, so, uh, or sorry, 0.01, so you will have to manually type in numbers every once in a while. 
Yeah, so for me, a scale of 0.005 works pretty well. We can also give these particles a random size just by clicking on the random size and changing it to somewhere around 0.5. That way we get a little bit of size variation among the rain droplets. Of course, this really won't matter too much because they're moving very fast and they're just gonna be covered in motion blur. Great, so now that we have our rain particles emitting, it's time to start working with these and the ground plane to make the two interact with each other. In this case, I'm going to go ahead and select the ground plane. I'm going to come into the physics tab over here on the right and select dynamic paint. I'll add a canvas object and I'll change the format to paint. By the way, dynamic paint is a really cool feature in Blender. I actually made a video a while back going over like the general overview of dynamic paint. There will be a card up there or maybe it's, no, it's over there. Yeah, it's over here. So anyway, um, what is it? Once we have this uh, image sequence uh, dynamic paint canvas loaded up here. Um, we won't have to worry too much about the resolution because honestly the resolution is, we're just gonna do a preview I guess first. Um, we'll leave anti-aliasing enabled uh, and then all we really need to do is come into the dynamic paint advanced settings, disable drying, that way when the rain particles hit they don't dry up after a few seconds because rain doesn't typically do that. Um, and then we'll also come down to the dynamic paint effects here and we have three different effects. We have spread, drip, and shrink. We'll use spread because we want these particles to hit and then we kind of want their water to spread out a little bit uh, like they would in the real world. So we'll change the spread speed to somewhere around 0.02. We want this to be nice and slow because a high number will just make it just bleh, like go crazy. Um, anyway, we pretty much have our canvas object set up at least for a preview. So now let's go ahead and add our dynamic paint brush object, which in this case is going to be our plane up here. So we'll select dynamic paint, we'll change the type to brush and add a brush object. And then instead of using the mesh volume as our dynamic paint source, right? The thing doing the painting, we're going to use the particle system. And basically we can assign these particles to act as though they are the dynamic paint brushes by doing this. So from the particle systems here, we'll select our particle system and we'll also change the radius down to something very small. Now, I don't have any specific units set up in this scene, so I'm gonna have to kind of play around with it, but 0.05 might work well. Actually, no, 0.03 would probably work better. Um, and then we'll also have the smooth radius. Usually I set the smooth radius to be about one third of that of the uh, particle solid radius. So in this case, one third of 0.03 is 0.01. So that value should work pretty good for me. So let's go ahead and give this a test. Uh, I'm going to come back into the dynamic paint brush object and I'm going to drop down the dynamic paint output. All right, so one thing you do have to make sure that you do with your uh, ground plane or whatever is receiving the wetness is that it has to be UV unwrapped. Otherwise, this just won't work at all. So I'm going to go ahead and select a directory for this to output to. In this case, I'll just create a folder in this directory with the tutorial and just call this um, what map. You can call it whatever you'd like, just something you can remember. Um, and then I'm going to uncheck the box that says paint maps and check the box that says wet maps. Additionally, I'm also going to change the sub steps up to somewhere around five. Basically what stub steps do is they add extra calculations in between each frame because sometimes when you're working with something, for example, if you watch some of these rain particles, you'll notice that between two frames, a particle will jump entirely across our plane here. That was a bunch of spam over here on the left. Um, but yeah, our particle will jump across the plane and it won't, you know, per se, interact with it at all. So by adding these sub steps, we can basically add smaller iterations in between our frames for which the physics simulation will be calculated. Anyway, I set sub steps to about five for the preview at least, and all I'm going to do now is hit bake image sequence. And up here at the top, you can see our image sequence starts baking. As you can see now, it just finished. My bake is complete, only took about nine seconds. So now I'm gonna go ahead and look at our bake to see how it came out. All right, so I'm in that same directory where I saved it to, and you can see I have my wet map folder here. And inside are a bunch of images full of white dots. And each of these white dots is when a particle collides with our ground plane. So this kind of gives you a decent idea of what's going on when it rains. Basically, this is these are rain droplets hitting our ground. So I wanna go ahead and actually preview this on our 3D scene in Blender here. So I'm going to open up our note editor here, which I already had open if you closed it or if you didn't have it open, go ahead and open up the note, open up the note editor. Um, and we'll press Shift A, select Texture and select Image Texture. Then 
We'll click open and navigate to wherever our wet map is saved. Now we don't want to open any specific image. We want to open the entire image sequence. So in order to do that, I'll just press A twice to select everything and select open image. Then I'll connect the color output just to the base color input of our principled shader for now. And I'll check the box that says auto refresh. Now if I switch into render view here, you can see that as the animation plays, our particles begin to collide with our uh, ground plane here and they begin to do stuff. Now, as you can see, our particles are pretty dang small and our rain droplet spots are way too big. So I'm gonna have to tweak these to make these a little bit smaller. So I just went ahead and fixed the scale to make these hopefully a little bit smaller and I'm baking again. Once it's done, I should just be able to move through the frames again and see the final result and that looks much better. We don't have those huge, huge particles anymore. Um, so the exact numbers I used for this were 0.01 and 0.003. So that kind of gives you an idea of what to use for this scene. Another thing that's kind of important is if you're using micro displacement or adaptive subdivision at all, make sure that you move that modifier below the new dynamic paint modifier that we just added in the modifiers tab. So this ground plane I used uh, micro displacement on, right? And I used adaptive subdivision. So in order to make it actually appear, I have to make sure that the subdivision surface modifier is the last thing in my modifiers list. Perfect. Well, since we're actually getting some pretty good results, I'm going to go ahead and bake the final result. And in order to do that, I'll select our ground plane again. I'm going to come into the physics properties. And this time where it says our resolution is 256 by 256 pixels, we'll change this up to something like 1024 and hit bake once again. Now this will take significantly longer because it's a lot more data that it has to process, but the end resolution will be significantly higher than our, well, bucket of pixels that we have right now. All right, and our second bake just completed in 140 seconds. Just a little bit over two minutes. So now if we go ahead and scrub through, you can see we have nice smooth circles wherever our raindrops are, which is absolutely perfect. Now, if for some reason you are noticing that a lot of particles are passing through and they're not leaving any sort of, you know, um, mark on the ground plane, try increasing your sub steps. That way you have more of those in between frame calculations. Great, so now let's go ahead and start working on the materials. I'm gonna switch into rendered view over here once again, that way we can get a you know live preview of our materials. And I'm also gonna switch into camera view because it's always best to view your materials from camera view. That way you can get an idea of what they actually look like from the camera. At least that's a little bit of psychology that I like to keep while working. Anyway, I'm going to disconnect our image texture from the principled shader and reconnect our um, color map and ambient occlusion map that have been mixed together. So. When wet materials encounter porous materials, such as this, uh, I don't know what to call this, stone, I guess here, they often cause them to get slightly darker and they also cause them to become slightly glossier, meaning that reflections are a little bit sharper. So we're going to be modifying these two texture maps in order to integrate our shader here. And if you saw my video on wet maps where it was just like a general wet maps video, we also went over the same exact technique. So if you watched that video, you probably already know this, but you know, might be worth the refresher. Anyway, in order to do this, I'm going to add two color ramps. So I'll press shift A, come down to converter and select color ramp. And then I'll just duplicate that by pressing shift D and moving it up. I'll hook up the color output to the color ramp inputs. And I'll also change the color or the image texture uh, data type or color space, anyway, uh, to non-color data. Perfect. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a hue saturation value node. This is under color and then hue slash saturation. I'm going to plug it in between our color and ambient occlusion mix and the principled shader. I'm going to drop the saturate, or I'm sorry, I'm actually gonna boost the saturation to somewhere around 1.25. I'm gonna drop the value down to 0.75. Then I'm going to connect the top color ramp into the factor input. And basically what this will do is it'll restrict the area that this hue saturation value node is affecting to only the area expressed by this color ramp. Now, I don't quite see any specific droplets. Oh, there you go, you can kind of see them now. Um, but they still don't stand out very much. So I am actually going to boost the saturation to maybe 1.4. That looks a little bit better. I don't want to drop the value too much lower though. Maybe 
It'll take a little bit of tweaking and it depends on what your scene looks like, but hopefully you'll find something that works. Anyway, we have a good approximation for our principled color. Um, now let's go ahead and tweak our glossiness. And in order to do that, I'm going to add a math node. I'm going to change the mode to multiply and I'm going to drop it in between our roughness map and our principled shader, just like so. The next thing I'm going to do is hook up the output of this color ramp into the bottom value of our multiply map. And you'll notice that instantly, the majority of our material becomes extremely glossy, but the spots that should be wet are still very rough. So in order to fix this issue, we'll just come over here and you can either drag these two sliders to swap the positions. So the white is now on the left and the black is on the right, or you can just click this handy dandy little arrow that works as well. Either way, when you're done, you should end up with something that looks a little bit like this. Now, the reason I added color ramps instead of just plugging things in is because we can actually tweak the influence of these surfaces. For example, if I didn't want these rain droplets to be so strong and have such a hard edge, I might want to tweak the settings here to be a little bit softer so that things, instead of being that hard edge, kind of have a gradient that builds up to the center. So this is already starting to look pretty good. You can see that at the beginning we have no rain droplets and as things become more advanced, we have a lot of rain droplets. But there is still one small issue, that being that our rain droplets are perfectly reflective. Now in reality, almost nothing is perfectly reflective unless it was made to be perfectly reflective. So we'll just add a tiny little bit of roughness to it to kind of you know simulate that surface fluid interaction. In order to do that, we'll come into our color ramp that controls our roughness. And instead of having a pure black value here, we'll boost this value up to something that's just a very dark gray. And honestly, I think that looks pretty good. And you can see by the end, we have an entire arsenal of things. Now the last setting we need to tweak in order to sell our realism here is to enable motion blur. I'm actually gonna get rid of my node editor here. I'm also gonna save my project file. In order to enable motion blur, all we have to do is come into our camera settings, Check the box that says motion blur and set the shutter to somewhere between 0.3 and 0.5. If you're going for a more physically accurate thing based upon like your actual in-scene camera and its aperture, of course, go for that. Um, but if you're just looking for a general number, usually between 0.3 and 0.5 works pretty well. So there it is. There is an awesome way to make realistic particulate rain that actually interacts with your material in Blender. If you guys have any more tricks involving wet maps or any tricks to make rain more realistic, be sure to leave them down in the comments below. We'd love to see them. And if you're interested in learning all of this stuff about Blender, head over to cgcookie.com and hook yourself up with a subscription for tons and tons of Blender content.